over IP. His partner, Jacob Nerdy, uh, founded Delta 3, which became almost a $2 billion company, and they're trying to do essentially WhatsApp for business. So that, that's a, an interesting. So that's just a sense of some of the companies we're doing at. We look at these, these deals, we do a standard sort of venture funnel. Um, when we look for companies, we're looking for great teams, big markets, easy to understand value props, companies with traction, even if they're early, they gotta have some traction. Sponsorship, <coughs> other people who are co-investing with us, and we seek deals, we're valuation sensitive. As I mentioned before, we do deals from seed all the way up to uh, later stage, uh, around C and D, we just did around E, believe it or not. Uh, we're co-investing with leading you know, angels both in Israel and in uh, the Valley. Uh, we're co-investing with, you know, I think, a, a pretty neat list of uh, uh, venture funds, people like Battery, and Bessemer, and Canaan Partners, and uh, Coastal, we mentioned, Excel and Index, companies like 3M and General Electric um, and Microsoft. Um, and uh, we've got a great team. We need more women, okay? The, I heard that uh, discussion, and it is, by the way, not just a U.S. problem, it is a worldwide problem. There are no women, not enough women venture capitalists, there are not enough women uh, entrepreneurs out there or back, and there are not enough women crowdfunders. And we're, we're committed to trying to you know, do that, and uh, uh, we're failing miserably. Okay, we're, you know, as, as an industry, I think we're failing, and I, I feel personally that we're failing. I, I would help, if anybody could help me you know, figure this one out. Um, we have a great mentor program, uh, people who are helping these companies. These are people who've run you know, big companies before and are now sitting on the boards um, and uh, uh, representing us. Uh, we've gotten very, very kind uh, coverage in the press. And uh, that's it. And I'd like to have some dialogue with the time left um, that we can, uh, you know, keep just a few minutes from the, the liquid refreshment, which I would love myself. Um, and uh, I, again, I want to thank Richard and the whole team here for putting together a great symposium that I saw of it. And uh, I hope that, that this continues on in terms of establishing benchmarks and data and analysis of what we all sense in our gut is going to be a real you know, groundbreaking and, 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 and fundamentally transformational you know, change in the innovation finance industry. But it's early days. And I think there's a lot of you know, sort of noise in the system. And people, that, you know, we need to understand from our early experience what works and what doesn't work, what kind of deals work, how do you help these companies. I mean, I've got 50 companies in the portfolio. How am I supposed to manage this? Okay, we're going to have 100 companies. And we take this management seriously. We're looking at the problems of scale. Okay, of how do we, you know, get reports out? How do we send out all these K-1s? Okay, and it's one thing to be managing a, you know, venture fund where you got, you know, 70 or 80 limiteds. You know, I, I'm going to have thousands and tens of thousands of limited partners who I've got to make happy. How do we get them to help build these companies? These are problems that, that you know, if someone says, oh, I've got all the answers, and they're completely full of shit, okay? And the reality is that we're making up half of this stuff, and probably more, as we go along, and uh, uh, we'd love to have you involved in your feedback. And again, thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the only thing I can say is we've had a lot of experience with this, unfortunately. The, the reality of living in Israel is one of you know, great joy for me. Uh, I grew up in the States, I was you know, born in San Diego, raised in LA, school here, went up after my freshman year to, to visit Israel and, and fell in love and taught myself the language and it, it resonated with me deeply in terms of my own heritage and, and uh, uh, my roots and so I, I, I went back. Um, but in the last 10 years, we fought four wars, okay? And so what's bizarre and almost uncanny, especially someone who doesn't live there, is that each time the stock market goes up, we go to war, the stock market goes up. The shekel gets stronger, God forbid, and we need a weaker shekel because we're an export-driven economy. Um, people have just sort of written off this risk. I mean, Warren Buffett is not a big risky guy, right? Warren Buffett is about value investing in the year. You know, you guys in, in Kaufman in the Midwest, he's a Midwesterner, okay? When he made his first major move outside of the US, he didn't do it in Germany or in the UK or in Japan. His first major investment out of the US was in Israel. 
He chose to do it in July of 2006, when we were fighting a nasty war with Hezbollah. And he spent $4 billion to buy 80% of a company called Iskar that happened to be located 1,500 meters from the Lebanese border. And people thought he had lost, you know, those, he was only 75 then, you know, today's a little bit older, but they thought finally it's broken, right? That magic is gone. What is he doing? And uh, it turns out that the, the proximity of the border was good because most of the missiles flew right over. <laughs> um, the reality is this company has been a spectacular investment for him. He just completed the purchase six years later and spent double. He spent two billion for the remaining 20%, so he's put six billion dollars in. And it's ranked as one of the top five producers for Berkshire Hathaway. So go figure, you know, when guys like Buffett are there, um, you know, the, the Chinese and Indian and Japanese investors, Rakuten just spent $900 million buying the Israeli company. These guys were not, you know, they, they don't have a history of Zionism or Israel lobbies in their country, you know, we can't, you know they're, they're just about business, right? And they are discounting this political risk. Because face it, we all are at risk, okay? We're living in a risky world. Maybe the world's caught up with Israel, unfortunately. Okay, that, uh, you know, just look around. And so, you know, this business is about risk acceptance, right? In other words, people say, well, why do you have so many startups in Israel, right? What is, what is your secret sauce? Why is this country called Startup Nation? Because it really is a little bit bizarre how many startups we've got. And I think one of the answers there is because we have so much risk and we've learned to live with risk. I mean, frankly, the risk of starting a company compared to the existential risk that we live under, big deal. What's the worst thing that can happen? You lose some money, get another job, get over it. Okay, it's just really, uh, and, and so it, it, in a way, that risk has become our friend and has been a, a, a driving factor for our whole entrepreneurial time. Um, two quick questions. One, are you guys US-based or Israel-based? Headquarters is in Israel. We have offices now in New York, Chicago, San Diego, soon to be announced in Silicon Valley. So are you guys operating under the Jobs Act then? We operate under Title II. We're doing public solicitation. We're collecting all the data. We, we follow, by the way, again, we have investors from over 40 countries. So the Jobs Act is the least of our problems. Okay? <laughs> you know, go figure out, you know, uh, uh, trust me, there are many countries where there's like no legislation. Um, I'm going to be speaking with regulators at a worldwide conference uh, next month in Brazil. Okay? And someone said, why are you going there? Don't, you know, you've saved under the radar. I said, no. You know, we got to understand this because each of the countries, they're all looking at the SEC and they're a little bit scared. They're trying to figure this out. But um, what we do, we go to our site, we put up the accreditation criteria for the country in which you live. So in Australia, it's different. And, and again, only 50% of our money right now is being sourced in the U.S. Probably the majority of the money is coming from outside the U.S. China, is there any exit? From one of your... Uh, yes, as I mentioned, the Rewalk is just finishing its, its IPO, got going this week. Hi, John. Uh, I'll send for Singapore. Uh, I want to thank you for sending that into the recent summit. Oh, thank you. And uh, my, my question is, what is our top direction as far as Asia is concerned? Since you said you, know, you operate from so many countries, and you're talking to the SEC, please talk more. <laughs> <laughs> we are planning to open an office initially in Hong Kong will be our first office in Asia. Um, we will open an office in Shanghai afterwards. And I don't know when we'll get to Singapore. Uh, we, we, we like Singapore. We're, we've been spending a lot of time traveling in Asia. You know, um, Richard mentioned my travel schedule. It's, I mean, I'm pretty much in Asia every six weeks. Mm -hmm. And we think the opportunity there is beyond enormous. <coughs> because, um, first of all, it's much fresher. And there is no history of sort of angel investing, mm -hmm. even to the extent that you, we have it here in Silicon Valley or in Israel. And yet there's a, just a huge pent up demand um, to get involved in equity. They don't really understand equity. You know, most Asian investors have been into real estate or you know, debt or you know, fixed income things. They're getting very, very excited about the stock markets. And to the extent that they begin to understand this kind of investing, we think that there is just unlimited you know, a potential supply of, of capital, but it's gonna be the Wild West. If you look, for example, at lending right now, you know, peer-to-peer -peer lending in China. I mean, uh, Ron's here, how many, how many platforms? I mean, 2,000, 3,000? I mean, there, you know, there are 
more. <laughs> okay? I mean, there are so many platforms. So it's going to be a bonanza in Asia. What we think our you know, sort of uh, unfair advantage is that most of the Asian platforms that will be domestic will be offering cool Chinese companies or cool Japanese companies. I think that the, the real challenge is to build a global platform. Because an Asian who, who, who's smart about this is going to want to invest not just in a company locally in Shanghai or in Singapore, but in a company from Israel and a company from the Valley and a company from Africa, okay? And we're trying to, to build truly a global platform. And um, this is not easy, but I think that the upside for us if we succeed in this gambit is, is pretty significant. And one more word. Jonathan, I, I have a question on the scale. Uh, you talked about uh, you know, the challenges in achieving scale given the fact that you are invested in many of this, most, most of the companies, and maybe not. When, when is my money going to run out? <laughs> so, 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 so my, uh, I'm just curious that you know, when you grow larger, right, you like go into thousands, do you have any thought about divesting back your stake into the crowd and you know, focusing on this certain limited set of companies that you want to manage? No. So you know, look, I, I think that one of the things which we're interested in researching with uh, people in academia is a whole new look at sort of, uh, you know, venture portfolio theory. I mean, you know, there's a sort of a commonplace that a venture fund, you know, should have 15, 20, 25 companies to get diversification. We have proof that that's true, okay? In other words, where's the, where's the empirical proof? The answer is because most venture funds never had bigger portfolios because they, there's all these rules in the venture game, right? In other words, so many, you know, five deals per partner, 50 million of capital, you know, per partner. You, you hear all these things. You, you raise a fixed sum of money. And then later on, when, the, when you run out and companies need additional rounds, you then have this sort of uh, devil's choice of going to raise a uh, annex fund, or do you have a, what's called a cross-fund investment, where fund four invests back into fund three. What happens when it's a down round? One of the beauties of our platform is that it's, each deal is independent. And that's why we're finding it so exciting to do follow-on rounds. We have to make a decision on behalf of the crowd whether it makes sense the second time. And not because we've put you know, good money. We don't, we don't want to put additional good money after bad money. And it, it turns out that you know, the disadvantage of our kind of investing is I don't have a fund. The advantage of our kind of funding is I don't have a fund, OK? Is that I, you know, I have this, the ability to raise unlimited capital as long as we're bringing good deals to an ever-growing you know, group of people. And we, we are going to ch challenge this issue of scale. I don't believe that 50 companies is a limit, or 100 companies, or 500 companies. Okay? It's up to us. We've raised a lot of money for our platform. We're going to raise additional money. And we're trying to pioneer ways that we can, on the one hand, manage this so it doesn't just grow like some kind of cancerous growth out of control but deliver results, okay, and, and, and because you never know, it's that unicorn. I mean, I, I made up, uh, so far, it's actually now closer to 160 investments as a venture capitalist, as an angel, now a crowdfunder, and I finally got my first billion dollar, you know, outcome, okay, it's personal before the, the um, it's not yet done, with, you know, companies raising money at fairly crazy values. And, you know, if I tell you that I, that was one that I was really smart, no way, okay? It's because I've got this corpus of investments. I've had a lot of good success, but you never know. And so the beauty here, at least from my perspective as a proprietor, is if we build this wonderful thing, we deliver good results. But, you know, people say, what can go wrong? What can go wrong is we don't deliver results. If people invest in our platform and they lose their money, believe me, the truth will catch up to you. Okay, so you know that's what you know keeps me up at night is that we've got to not only choose great deals, but we've got to help them because all of these companies need help. They all need introductions to further investors. They need introductions to uh, uh, corporate partners. They need help in hiring. They need access to the media. All the things that a venture fund does, and to think that crowdfunding sort of escape that reality and say no, 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 we're not going to worry about that. That's somebody else's problem. Okay, we're just going to give them money at a key moment and let them get on with their business. I think that's a huge mistake. And, I, and we're trying to, you know, see if we can make a, a, a sort of a hybrid path, you know, work. Thank you, guys. And, uh, thank you.
liquid beverage, so here's a star. <laughs> Thank you very much. And look, he's sticking around for conversion. Thank you, John. Amazing. So the, the, what blew me away was two years ago, we were at the Venture Capital Associ Angel Capital Association, National Venture Capital Association, Venture Forward. And to say that they were negative and thinking that crowdfunding was a joke would be an understatement. I mean, it was like, this is a really cute idea from some kids, and this will never be anything of substance. I think most of the leading VC firms were in a slide deck. That's in two years. So I think you're, you're a trailblazer in multiple ways. And we always tell our students at Berkeley, follow your passions and go make a difference in the world. And I think you're a fantastic example of having done that. So thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. So, so tomorrow we're going to get more academic on you.